This is Mrs. Alexander, and this is your 213 front load. It talks about feedback, homeostasis, some examples, and more specifically, diabetes. We've learned in class about insulin and its role in the body to help reduce your blood glucose levels, and you should understand that that is your body trying to maintain homeostasis. And we talked about beta cells that are inside the pancreas, which actually release the insulin. Um, but now we're going to learn about not just beta cells, but alpha cells and the opposite of insulin, something called glucagon, which does the opposite of what insulin does. Instead of reducing blood glucose level, it helps bring it back up to normal whenever it's too low. Feedback, you've probably heard the word feedback before when you used to describe two people talking about something they just saw or watched and giving feedback. In the body, it has to do with homeostasis. Homeostasis is when the body wants to bring whatever is going on within the body back to a normal set level. Feedback signals are used by your brain and by your body to control homeostasis. There are certain results that happen whenever feedback is achieved. It's found in many living and non-living systems. For example, machinery has feedback systems. If something goes wrong in a machine, it tells it to stop making parts or if it needs to sound an alarm to let the tech know to come on over and give it a checkup. It's, that's kind of how our body works too, like a big robot. They keep our systems working efficiently. They can either stop or negate whatever is going on in the system because it's getting away from homeostasis. That's called negative for negate. Or in rare situations, very few situations, um, you can have positive feedback. Positive meaning that it will amplify something that is not normal. Well, that's kind of weird. Well, we'll go into when your body would actually use positive feedback. 99% of the examples we're going to use today and throughout this semester will be negative feedback. Please don't think of negative as bad. Negative, again, just means to negate or to stop whatever's going on in the body that's going away from homeostasis. Here's a nice little image that goes over those key points I just mentioned, negative versus positive. Please be aware of the differences. Again, negative tries to bring the body back to normal or back to homeostasis. Positive moves away from that, and it increases something that's away from homeostasis. We call these things stimuli or stimulus. Stimulus is something that's stimulating the body to change or go the opposite direction. Examples of negative that we're going to cover in this presentation are body temperature and blood glucose regulation. Examples in this presentation about positive are when fruit ripen, blood clots, and a process that happens during childbirth. During my presentation, there will be embedded videos about the different types of feedback. Please pause the video, watch the videos, or go back to them on your own time. During those videos, I would like you to pause and complete the self-test questions. See me in class if you are confused or if you don't know the answers. Let's start with positive feedback loops. We've talked about how they're characterized, um, but in other words, an increase in a positive feedback causes an increase in your body for something to happen, whereas a negative feedback causes a decrease or causes something to happen that stops whatever's going on. The first example we're going to use of positive feedback is whenever a woman's body needs to give birth. During the nine months that she is pregnant, her normal homeostasis is to care for and keep that child within her so that it can grow and develop. Once that baby is developed, the brain will receive a message and it will release the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin is the hormone that allows the body to squeeze and cause the muscles to contract in the uterus to force that baby out. If your body had that hormone all the time, then you would be trying to deliver the baby before it was too early. This is why it's positive feedback, because it only occurs very small situations, not very often in a woman's life, and it is a signal or a feedback message that goes away from the normal. It increases something that's not usually there. And with the oxytocin, the contraction gets stronger, and the woman can give birth. So here's a little picture that shows a positive feedback loop. Um, the baby stimulates the gland to secrete oxytocin when it's ready to come out. Oxytocin is carried through the bloodstream, and then it goes to the area in which the baby is carried, the cervix, and that causes it to contract and squeeze and push. The baby of the head of the baby comes out, and as soon as the head of the baby comes out, the baby is not pushing on the cervix anymore, then the oxytocin stops. So that's how the positive feedback stops. 
Another example is blood clotting. So let's think about this. If your blood clotted all the time within you, you would die. So it's not something that normally happens. It only happens when it's needed, and it goes away from normal homeostasis. For example, you cut yourself, and that blood is coming out, and you need it to clot so that it forms a scab and you don't bleed to death. That hormone is called, or that protein is called prothrombinase, and it works with your calcium item ions to form those um, clots using thrombin and fibers and all sorts of things. You just need to understand that blood clotting is an example of positive feedback because whenever you cut yourself, a positive feedback or a positive signal that increases those proteins happens. And then as soon as your blood clots, the thrombin is not released anymore. Eventually it becomes stable and it quits. Please watch this two minute video about positive feedback and blood clotting. One more example of positive feedback is whenever the ocean's sea ice melts. You've probably heard of this called global warming. Um, a change in temperature causes a warmth, so the temperature of the air and the planet is warming up for whatever reason you'd like to argue. The sea ice is melting faster than it normally does. Once the sea ice melts, that causes the ocean to heat up, the water to absorb more solar energy and that causes the temperature of the ocean to warm up which causes the sea ice to melt even more and the temperature to warm up even more. Positive feedback in this case is not a great thing because it's going away from the normal homeostasis. Right now there's ice that's frozen and that's how our world is um, continuing on. That's its homeostasis kind of like a machine and once it, one thing rises the other thing rises. That brings us back to negative feedback loops, the most common one. <clears throat> in the body um, negative feedback is much, much more common. Again, negative feedback comes from the word to negate or to stop whatever is going on in the body that's moving away from homeostasis. So it's bringing it back down to normal. It, that could be something is increasing in your body, which causes something else to come back to normal. It's not necessarily up or down. It's just coming back to normal. For example, when you set your temperature in the classroom for 71 and body temperatures um, cause that temperature of the room to go up so more kids enter then the thermostat kicks on which will trigger something one of the temperatures to either go up or down depending on what it needs to do to come back to normal it doesn't matter if the temperature is rising or, low or lowering it's trying to come back to a set point wherever you set it or wherever your body is normal at negative feedback temperature regulation works just like it does with the thermostat but it works inside of you if you get too hot from exercise, then you will sweat. Sweat creates evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling is whenever the sweat or the water that's on your skin picks up the air and cools off. This causes the little vessels in your arms, under your skin, to vasodilate. That means they get bigger and they carry oxygen to the surface. Uh, blood is carried to the surface to allow the convection or the, the air to pass over it. The temperature of your drop falls. Um, your temperature falls and then it goes back to your normal temperature and your cooling mechanism is turned off and you don't sweat anymore. Um, dogs can't do this, they can't sweat, so they pant. And when they pant, their tongues are usually out and slobbery. That slobber on their tongues is picking up the air, the evaporative cooling, and their blood is rushing through their tongue and that's what's cooling off. So their tongue is allowing their bloodstream to get cooler from their panting. Kangaroos and some fox do this as well, and they lick their arms, or they lick their fur for this to happen. Um, this is also why African elephants have larger ears than Asian elephants, because African elephants' ears are so huge and they flap them whenever they're really hot. Uh, it's more hot in Africa than it is Asia, so that's why Asian elephants have smaller ears. Evaporative cooling, just some biology for you. When you're too cold, you shiver. And so goosebumps, your hair standing straight up, is to trap the warm air between your skin and your hair. And goosebumps to generate, you know, uh, burr, to generate movement is to signal some energy to be released. Your skin pulls tight to conserve heat. You get goosebumps and they vasoconstrict. So vasoconstrict is when your little vessels constrict or get smaller. The smaller they are, the less surface area, and then the blood can actually warm up faster. It's pulled inward, less convection goes on, that sh shivering happens, and then once your temperature rises back to normal, your shivering stops. So when you shiver, you should move around, rub around, um, put some layers on that's telling you that you're too cold, obviously. 
So the big words in that were vasodilate and vasoconstrict. To dilate means to get bigger, to allow more surface area for the blood vessels to cool off. Vasoconstrict means to get smaller so there's less surface area so that your blood can warm up. And 37 degrees Celsius is normal body temperature. Negative feedback loops, another example, are blood pressure, glucose. Those are two big examples. In blood pressure, we use a negative feedback with our cells called baroreceptors. When we get frustrated, upset, or our blood pressure rises for whatever reason, the receptor cells send a message to your brain to decrease your heart rate and in turn tries to decrease the pressure in your blood um, and to calm you down. Here's a three minute video clip that will go into blood pressure. Watch it please. All right, now the next couple of slides are about diabetes because that's the unit we're in. Um, whatever we learned in class was that your pancreas releases insulin, which stimulates blood glucose to get into the cell, glucose glute force, and that lowers your blood sugar. Well now, that is negative feedback, so is the opposite, the top part of this chart. Um, glucagon is kind of like insulin, but it does the opposite. Instead of telling blood glucose or glucose to get in the cell, glucagon just tells the liver to release stored glucose. We call stored glucose glycogen. We call the hormone from the pancreas that tells it to release glycogon. So know those vocabulary words. Um, and you need to understand that this happens between the liver and the pancreas. So know glycogen is in the liver, glucagon is in the pancreas. Here's that same picture, but I've kind of labeled out alpha cells and beta cells and where their role is in this. Numbers one through four on the top two high blood glucose levels you've already covered in class. You know how the beta cells in the pancreas sense glucose and release insulin from the pancreas. But now we're going to learn about when your blood glucose is too low. For example, you haven't eaten all day or you've, you've eaten fine but then you go work out and you get kind of shaky and tired because your body just used all that's reserved. Um, glucose is in the bloodstream. Well, your liver will store glucose from the previous couple meals you made as glycogen. And in the pancreas, instead of releasing insulin, when it needs more glucose, it releases glucagon. Glucagon travels to the liver, tells the glycogen to come out into the bloodstream and free up some glucose. And this will allow your blood glucose level to rise and help you have that okay sensation and not pass out. So how does that all relate to diabetes? Diabetes is a disease. A disease is when your body doesn't do something it's supposed to do, and it affects your overall health. In the case of diabetes, it's when insulin doesn't correctly get into the cell. For type 1, insulin low or no amount is produced. Therefore, the negative feedback loop that tries to control when your blood glucose is too high is affected. So if you notice here, I take out insulin. For example, beta cells don't work because your body is killing them off in type 1 diabetes as a young child or young adult. Those, your immune system is attacking the beta cells, so they can't produce the insulin. No insulin secreted, then your blood glucose li levels rise and stay out of control. Type 2 diabetes, too much um, glucose, again, throughout your life, has become some sort of insulin resistance. And so either the insulin isn't getting in the cell the right way, or your glute force isn't bringing the glucose in because they're not communicating with the insulin correctly. Glucose levels increase without a check, and the balance goes out of whack. Um, some people have said that they suffer from something called low blood sugar. That's just whenever the glucagon isn't being released correctly, so that would be like a X on the, the bottom part of this chart. But for this class, you need to know where the feedback loop goes wrong. Where's the error? Notice this picture. The error is when the insulin tries to get into the cell, or the insulin is trying to be released. And so be sure to be able to identify a negative feedback loop and tell me where it goes wrong in diabetes. I'm going to bring you back to the last slide. Um, the last slide is a previous slide we've already seen. Again, go back to these and know the difference between negative and positive feedback. And if you'd like, and if the time allows in class or for homework, go ahead and watch this 15-minute video. Um, another teacher created it. He has his whole channel. It's a pretty good video about feedback loops.